Welcome to uh, a recorded edition of Behind the Point Spread. Good to have you along as we go through four important games in the college football world. I'm Travis Justice. I'll be joined shortly by Dr. Rob Zadiska and, of course, uh, Vegas insider Scott Spritzer. If you want to know uh, more of what we're talking about tonight, well, we, we've got good stuff for you. But before we dive right in, I want you to follow us on the social media channels. If you haven't subscribed to the Doc Talk Sports YouTube channel, please do so at Doc Talk Sports. You can also like our Facebook page at Doc Talk Sports and uh, follow Dr. Rob Zadisk on Twitter, who's over well over 12,000 followers now. That dude's pretty popular um, at Doc Talk Sports. And if you want to follow me, I'm nowhere near Dr. Rob. I'm like at that 7,000, 8,000 follower, but uh, I'd like to get that up a little bit. Uh, you can follow me at Travis creates look at everybody up on the, uh, on the screen right now. It's Dr. Rob Zadiska. It's Scott Spreicher. How you guys doing tonight? Doing, doing all right. right. Yeah. Good. You know, Scott, we actually got a question that came in from Brent uh, before we dive into the games tonight. And I think it's a, I think it's a pretty important question because you talk each and every week about your power rankings, right? Sure. And, and Brent was wondering, Hey, I was wondering outside of Scott's power ratings index, what other factors loom large when handicapping game? Is it home field uh, coming off a big win, coming off a big loss, off a of bye week, weather, recent trends, historical trends, coastal time differencing, coaching insights, any other factors that you have after you look at your power index? Okay, I'm gonna, I got to look at this. Uh, all of that that he asked is included in the power index. You know, really it is. To a certain extent, some things more important than others. I'm not a big oh my gosh, you know, Team A has a their big rivalry game next week against Team B, so they're going to be looking ahead. I, I'm not into that too much. Um, I, I think we might have talked about this a few weeks ago, and I used to say, you know, growing up in Omaha, it seemed like Nebraska always pummeled whoever they were playing the week before they played Oklahoma. You know, it was like no distraction. They were going out there, and they were winning 56 to 10. That's all there was to it. And a lot of times it was their best game of the season, you know, on both sides of the line of scrimmage, talking 70s, 80s, that kind of stuff. And I know there's the Ohio State number that's out there. I think they're one and seven against the spread the last eight times the week before Michigan. But again, it's one of those things where you're like, I think splitting hairs when you start talking about teams looking past opponents or, you know, coming off a big win. I think you got to be like an also ran kind of football team, like maybe UConn this week, just as an example. They got their bowl eligible win last week in an underdog role against Liberty. And it was an upset. And they were outplayed for a good chunk and still got the win. That's a team that you might just, maybe not a letdown, but maybe the fire isn't quite as hot going into that next game after you just got your most important win of the season. And you're going to potentially go bowling because of that win. So, but it's a little bit of everything he said, you know, coaching, home field advantage, you know, this thing that everybody gives, or not everybody, but a lot of the non-betting media will give a, an automatic three for home field advantage to me yeah. is BS. There are some teams you want to play in Tuscaloosa. You think their home field advantage is the same as it is in Lincoln. Are you absolutely kidding me? <laughs> you know, so everybody's got a different home field advantage. You might start at three and then you might go a little bit up and a little bit down with your home field advantages throughout the course of the season. Uh, but yeah, there are little things that I factor in coaching obviously is a big factor to my, my power ratings. Uh, Dr. Rob, I noticed you're going with the Giants jersey or a sweatshirt tonight. What's up with that? <laughs> They're seven and two. Come on. <laughs> Are you winning with the Giants, Scott? <laughs> have, have the Giants won you any money this year? You know what? Before the season began, I had the Giants as one of my worst four teams in the NFL. So I was all over that. <laughs> but, <laughs> but listen, I, I, I have made a few bucks with the Giants uh, since they've been winning games. They've got a coach who knows how to push the right buttons. Players that believe. Saquon Barkley is a monster. You know, I'm glad to see he's healthy again. I love that guy. Yeah, that's, I think that's kind of been the big part of it is I exactly. think he's really healthy. I, I like Dable as a coach. The, oh, yeah. uh, the the thing that I always worry about a little bit, they're not nuking anybody. Right. I mean, every win, it's – I mean, it tends to be a little bit on the low-scoring side. I mean, it's kind of these closer games. It's – you know, when you were talking about the, the Iowa-Wisconsin game and – how that's a how that's a game you're probably not putting money on. I look at the Giants, and I mean, it always kind of strikes me like that. Like every single one of their yeah. games is like Iowa against Wisconsin. <laughs> it was Rob. It's like it, I was just gonna say, it's like watching Seattle with all these games. You know, I mean, it, it's Geno Smith for freaking. You know, I mean, it's 
Yeah, you would bring that up since they just beat the Giants. Well, <laughs> but, weeks ago. but I was just going to mention that, you know, halfway through his last year at West Virginia, you know, up until then, he was a Heisman front runner. And Texas Tech threw a wrench into the system, started defending him a little bit differently, threw a little bit of a mix of man and zone. And Gina was having a really rough time reading defenses. And then Snyder was next, Kansas State. He saw what Texas Tech did. He did the same thing, basically, maybe a couple of little switches here and there. And all of a sudden, that was it for Gino. He just collapsed after that the rest of the season. And he hasn't played all these years. And I'm sitting there thinking, you know, I got to give this guy a busload of credit because obviously he's being coached well by Pete Carroll and that incredible staff. But he's also lasted. He's gone through a whole lot of shit, so to speak, over his NFL <laughs> career. Yeah, and he's lasted. Right. Yeah, and, and, and he's focused, he's lasted, and he's now learning, you know, and he's reading defenses. It's like the game's no longer too quick for him. Now, listen, I'm not saying he's NFL MVP or anything like that, but I do have to admit, going into the season, Seattle, the Giants, they were two of my uh, lowest five power-rated NFL teams. As Rob said, you keep waiting for both of these teams, but especially the Giants to fall back a little bit. And I got to say this, I've been watching this, you know, Eli and, and, uh, and Peyton Manning show on Monday nights when they have it every few yeah. weeks or every couple of weeks, and uh, which to me has been awesome. I love it since the start of last year. But Eli's a former giant. When we get to get Dr. Rob on with the Manny brothers, I want to see Ooh. this. <laughs> I'm putting it out there. You've got a small time there. I That's think, okay. So. That's okay. You're a giant, man. <laughs> I've, I've met those guys. They're great guys. It's an awesome it family. Like yeah. Seems like it. I think Rob would do really well on the Manning cast. He, I, I he, think so. I, 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 I th- Rob, you, you're so cerebral that I, I think you would talk over Peyton. But I, Eli seems like the type of guy that would be would be on your level. I could be wrong. Those, those guys were interesting to me because, I mean, I think Peyton's the guy that kind of gets all the credit. But e- Eli was the guy that, you know, if you had a game and it was one of those kind of crunch time kind of games and you needed a game-winning drive – you needed a clutch play, a, a pass to David Tyree in the Super Bowl yeah. kind of thing. Eli was the guy who was the clutch guy. Sure. Peyton was the guy who went out and either beat you by three touchdowns or or lost the game. It was one of the two. There was no in-between with him. I never thought of Peyton as that clutch guy. He'd either just absolutely nuke you or lose the game. Yeah. So right. e- Eli was the clutch brother. All right, let's dive into this week's game, shall we? We're going to start off with uh, over uh, on the east side of the of the country. We're going to go to Virginia Tech at Liberty. You brought up Liberty last week, Scott, losing at Connecticut, which was, quite frankly, I thought a bad loss. But Liberty's going to be uh, a nine-and-a-half-point favorite uh, against Virginia Tech. And uh, the, the point total on this, 46-and-a-half. Yeah, I think Liberty bounces back here. You know, we've talked about, and we're going to talk about a little bit later in the show, Nebraska's collapse in the power ratings this year and where they sit. Virginia Tech's even lower than Nebraska. They're 91st in the country. Can you believe that? Virginia wow. Tech football is 91st uh, in the power ratings. Now, not everybody's power ratings are the same. Mine has them 91st. Other guys have them 95th, anywhere from 85th to 95th. And in my power ratings, they're two points lower than Nebraska. So this is a situation where you're talking about the Hokies at their very worst since, you know, before Frank Beamer arrived. Uh, They've been non-competitive in a lot of games, not all the games, but in a lot of games. One of the worst offenses in college football. They can't run. They can't pass. Uh, They didn't even show up against Duke last week. They lost that by 17. That's one of four double-digit losses by Vatek this campaign. And and do you really get excited? You're 2-8. and Your your season's done. You're... uh, and I don't want to say this as they are embar- you know, they're an embarrassment to the university. I'm just saying Virginia Tech's program has been so good for so long. I mean, you're like the worst of all those teams. You're two and eight. You're going on the road to a non-power five opponent named Liberty. I don't know that you get excited. If you're Liberty, you know, you're looking to extend your record to nine and two. I, I was watching the Hugh Freeze press conference Monday or Tuesday, and he spent a ton of that time talking about the importance of this game for Liberty's recruiting for those purposes and what it means to this program to be able to beat a team with that name across the front of their jerseys called Virginia Tech. They can run the football. I know their their running backs aren't completely healthy this week, but they can still run the football. Their quarterbacks are healthy, and I think it's a good spot. It's nine and a half, ten. I think Liberty probably wins this by 
know, 17 to 20 points. You know, the interesting part about, uh, about Virginia Tech, and I'm going to ask both of you this, does this program recover? Like Frank Beamer had it, you know, the best we've ever seen it. Uh, Justin Fuente did not uh, turn out to be the coach that we thought he was going to be. You look at the, where Virginia Tech is now in the, in the college football landscape. Does it recover? I'll let Rob answer first. <laughs> Boy, that's a tough one. Um, you know, they're a school that, I, I mean, I think they've got the potential to, to be pretty good again. I mean, but you got to go find another Frank Beamer, quite yeah. frankly. I mean, he, it's, you know, you look at what Nebraska has been looking for. And if you want to compare, I don't, I don't know if Virginia Tech's a bad comparison at all. I mean, you've got a school that, it, it's it, it's kind of like that ag tech school. It's not in a great location relative to some of the other schools around it. I mean, um, you don't have the incredible incredible amount of tradition there. You've got some, but that's a place where I think another Frank Beamer can go. And there's somebody who's going to kind of build an offense around strong run game, push special team, special team, special teams, kind of create a culture around sort of some of these fundamental aspects of football and can win a lot of games in the ACC. I mean, it's not a, it, it's not an incredibly brutal conference. I mean, it's, it's kind Fair. of a, in most given years, it's a one or two team conference, which honestly, it's kind of like you look at the big, look at the big 12 with, I don't know. I, I think Luke Fickle's never leaving Cincinnati because now the, the, the big 12 has essentially been gutted. And you got, I think Fickle's looking at that going, okay, well, now I don't need to leave Cincinnati for that big-time job anymore. I can stay here and potentially win this conference on a more consistent basis and still get into a 12-team playoff. So I think the ACC is the same kind of setup for a coach to come into a place like Virginia Tech and change stuff around. I think that with Virginia Tech, that's different than Nebraska – you still hear Nebraska talked about all the freaking time, you know, before the season, you hear about him, you hear about him being ranked in the top 30. Everybody talks about Nebraska and who they're recruiting, whether it be a good recruiting year, they're always there. But they named like all the blue bloods of college football a couple of weeks ago. And I yep. heard Nebraska was like one of the eight or nine yep. teams that, and, and they haven't had a really, a, a really good season in a decade. So that's where they've got that advantage over Virginia tech. I also think Virginia tech's, the type of school where if let's say a young, good coach, skilled coach comes in and all of a sudden he takes this team to eight or nine wins for two or three seasons, he's probably looking to go to that next level. I hate to call it a stepping stone job, but I would consider Virginia Tech stepping stone a lot more than Nebraska. If you get a guy to come into Nebraska and he can win nine, 10 games a season and be, you know, at least challenging for a big a spot of the Big Ten championship every other year, he's probably going to stay there at Nebraska. I don't know that that's the same with Virginia Tech. You know, it's, it's probably a place more like a Kansas or a Kansas State go. where yeah. somebody's going to come in. And I think, I mean, you look at like a Leipold, is he going to stay at Kansas for the remainder of his career? And I think if he gets kind of that next level offer to get out of there and go to a place that's not a basketball school, right. Leipold takes it. I mean, I, I think you're hitting the nail on the head. Vought Tech's probably a place like that. You're going to have to find a special coach who wants to be at that place. L let me push back on Lance Leipold for a little bit because uh, I think he stays at Kansas, and, and I'm going to tell you why. He's 58 years old. Um, I So, I mean, y y not too many institutions are going to hire somebody in their 60s anymore. Also, if he doesn't get, and this would be the year to do it, right? Or maybe next year, but they'll build a statue of him out in front of that stadium in Kansas just because of the turnaround. I mean, and, and the way he was able to do it so quick. Will I, they real? I mean, here's yes, my question though. Yes, Kansas, they will. Really? Yes. Did they for Glenn Mason? Uh, because I think what happened there, Rob, Glenn Mason did it in a different way, and Kansas football was rivaling just absolute obscurity almost not kansas state levels kansas state I, I think people will always forget and they need to go do a history lesson and you can find it on wikipedia how bad kansas state was not for 10 years not for 20 years not for 40 years for like 50 years right i mean i think it was like four bowl games over a 50-year period that was it but sure. kansas 
Kansas had fallen so far and became just this laughing stock that they were just screaming for anything to, 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 to turn it around. And the fact that he did it in a year and a half that he's going bowling and, and won some pretty big games, if he were to stay, he's 58. Let's say he stayed 10 more years. Absolutely, they'd build a statue of him if he so was winning just, seven, eight, nine games a year. He's gonna, I think he's gonna do well. I just, I mean, Glenn Mason did did well there, and I understand the difference, but, um, I mean, Kansas wasn't great before Glenn. No, Mason got they, they weren't. There. They weren't. But and Glenn they, they kind of nosedived again, and then Mangino came in, and I mean, Mangino took him to a, a like a BCS a, game. Went yeah, to a BC, I mean, won, won the Orange Bowl. Top 10 team, yep. Yeah. Yeah. It's, so, I mean, that's that's pretty impressive what Mangino did there. I mean, you're never going to see a statue of Mangino on that camp. No, no you're not. Not they, enough. They, Wait, I'm not going to go there. Yeah, they, <laughs> no, they, 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 could, they couldn't build it round enough for him. Let's go out to the West Coast. We went from the East Coast <laughs> out to the West Coast. Uh, rivalry. And who knows if anybody – this is game is going to be at the Rose Bowl. And who knows if anybody goes to this game because nobody goes to UCLA <laughs> games. Um, it's SC and UCLA, USC, a two and a half point favorite, but look at that over and under 76 points, 76 on the point total. You know, guys, I used to go to UCLA games at least once a year. And the last time I went was 2019. They've never supported this team in Pasadena. It's, it's, it's sick. It's crazy. It's a beautiful stadium. There's not a bad seat in the house because it's shaped like that bowl shape. You got trees popping up over the stadium, a golf course at one end of the stadium, right outside the parking lot. Uh, Rob, I, I probably saw you play there in 2013, uh, 1993, 2013. Yeah. In, in 1993, when I remember Lawrence Phillips was a freshman, if yeah. I remember correctly, and it was a 14 13 final score. That was and a I, really good UCLA. Oh, game. man. And, and it was a great game in the trenches. I mean, that was a battle, you know. And, and those of us who appreciate those kind of games, I was sitting there with my brother and a friend of ours who lives in LA, and we're like on the 40 yard line, but I'm looking at the stands, and there was maybe. I'll say 65,000 people. It holds about 100. And I would bet you 45,000 were wearing red. 100%. You know, 20,000 UCLA fans. Although the eight clap is pretty cool to do when you're, you know, sitting there watching a football game. But anyway, uh, you know, I'm I'm looking at this game. I'm thinking it's 14, 13, five minutes into the game. I mean, this (laughs) is going to be, this should be nutso. I have these two teams basically rated about the same. I have USC one point better than UCLA on a neutral field. This is in Pasadena. This will be the only time all season when UCLA has a true home field advantage where you can maybe add a field goal to their power rating. And because of that, I would make UCLA on their home turf in this game two points better than USC. USC laying two, two and a half right now on the road. I I look at this USC team and both teams, they're, they're so close as far as their numbers on offense. UCLA runs the ball better than USC but the passing yards, the points scored. USC is scoring over 42 a game. The Bruins are scoring about 40 a game. Then look at the flip side, and neither team can defend the pass. I mean, they're just – they can shred it week in, week out. There's no big pass rush from either team. Uh, they give up a busload of points. I'm going to say that UCLA pulls this out in a close, hard-fought Whoa. game with a, a bunch of points being scored. Again, I make USC one point better than them on a neutral field. They will have a little bit of a home field advantage. I think they win by a field goal or so over the Trojans. Wow. And uh, that total at 76, there's no way I'm playing it under. But my gosh, one drive that, you know, is a five or six minute drive from one team's own 20 to the other team's 20 that ends in a, a field goal or a missed field goal or an interception inside the 10 and your total screwed. You know, so, I mean, you need teams to score every time they have the ball for longer than two minutes in this game. So a lean opinion towards the over, I think UCLA catches them here, guys. In the wow. I, it doesn't, I, I was going to say though, I don't have any action on it. I'm just telling you, I think UCLA is going to, because you know, winning by two when you're a two and a half point dog is not that big of a deal. You know, it's not like shockerific, you know? <laughs> well, I, I don't know why I'm so shocked that you would think UCLA would win that. If not, you know, Chip, if he does, Chip Kelly get a nice big uh, contract extension, probably a pay raise over the. Well, hold on. UCLA didn't have any money right now. He won't get a pay raise. But he might get, <laughs> but he might get a contract extension. And maybe you know, they'll but, get 18,000 people for their next home game if geez, he wins this it's, one. It's you know? embarrassing how many people they put in that stadium. By the way, I am on Liberty. That is a bet. UCLA that, is an opinion that might become a bet by the week. And we'll see if I can. We'll, we'll see if I can get another half point on this game, which is if I get three and a half, I'm on the Bruins. I doubt it gets there, though. So look, before we dive into our final two games, I do want to ask you this for, for the nut, because we, we started off the show talking about your, your power rankings. 
let's say you've, you've been pretty up, up front about this, uh, about your services, which you can get at DocSports.com. And that is if you don't have like, if you're not going in like three, what was it? You say three, 400 a game or whatever that you're willing to, to, to put out there. Uh, let's say you're a novice guy. You're, you're like me, you're like 10, 25, 30 bucks a game, you know, it, but I can't afford your services or I can't afford something else. What, what's one thing people should be looking at when they make their bets? Just, I mean, if you're going to go out there and say, if you're going to be that novice guy, you know, you're going to play 10, 25, 30 bucks a game. What's the one thing or one, one or two things people should be looking at? Well, first of all, if they're, you know, if they want to jump on board, what I was talking about is don't buy season packages from anybody in the business, because if you're betting 50, 75, hundred bucks a game, you know, you'd have to hit like 85% or whatever it is. I did the math one day, 85% of your plays to get your money back and then win a, bit, a little bit. That's not going to happen. Nobody, nobody's hitting 85, 90% of their plays, no matter what movie you tend to watch. <laughs> and so, first of all, I, I just tell people all the time, you know, before making your bet, if you're doing this for entertainment purposes and there's nothing wrong with that, you want to have a, a 10 team, $10, $10 parlay. I don't play parlays, but for 10 bucks, you can make, you know, a whole lot of money. You can make four figures in some instances. So have fun with it. Spin, you know, there's packages like for 30 bucks for a day or 99 bucks for a weekend. If you're betting 50 bucks, 40 bucks, that kind of stuff, look for that stuff. But, you know, don't jump in and buy a whole season package because you're going to have to win way more than anybody's going to win, yeah. including myself, to be able to get your money back. Um, and that's what I tell people. I just tell people all the time, if you're just looking to have fun, there is nothing wrong with watching Ohio State, Michigan and going, you know what? I just spent a hundred bucks for my wife and my kid and I to go to a movie last night. And I got no chance to get that money back. You know, I'm going to throw 20 bucks on Ohio State, Michigan, enjoy the next three and a half hours. And maybe I'll win 20 bucks, you know, so I don't see the moral down point of any of that kind of stuff. You go to a movie, it turns out to be a flop. That director just made a crappy movie. Is he immoral? No, he just made a crappy movie, you know, so, and you're out the money. Uh, you know, I, I make crappy picks sometimes. I, I ended up five and two last weekend in college and pro. I split my top plays. I had a, a winner on Sunday. I had a loser on Saturday. I had the Baylor Bears, for God's sake, last week. Sometimes mm. it just doesn't go your way. So that's what I tell people, man. Just if you're going to have fun with it, just don't overstep your bounds. You can never play above your head. You don't want to dip into the the, the bankroll that you use for all your important stuff in life, taking care of your kids, your mortgage, your car payments. You want this to be separate. And that's why a lot of folks can't be pro betters because it's tough to develop a $100,000 bankroll that's just for betting, you know, to go into a football season. That's not easy to come by. And wow. so it's a situation where, you know, go ahead and have fun. Bet your $20 two-team parlays. You know, one of my favorite bets I ever made was before, right before I got into all this stuff, and we're talking, uh, it was about the time I got into it. It was the giants Bills Super Bowl, the wide right on the field goal. I had a two team parlay for 40 bucks. It paid me back. What did I get out of that? Uh, it's basically two and a half to one, you know, so I got enough money back to buy a pair of Reeboks. I was happy as it gets. <laughs> it was great. So I tell people all the time, go have fun, man. Have fun with it. Be entertained. You, you might get a return on some of that entertainment. All right, the uh, game I'm going to be keen in on is the Iowa Minnesota game. This is interesting because uh, Minnesota is a three point favorite. The 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 uh, the the point total on this is ridiculous at 32 and a half. Uh, but there's a lot riding on the line here because Iowa needs to keep winning if it wants to uh, be in the driver's seat or uh, have a chance at the Big Ten title game. Minnesota still with an outside chance chance at the Big Ten title game. Uh, this is a the, the the fight for Floyd of Rosedale, Scott. And, uh, I, you know, say what you want. I, I was offense is pathetic. I, they had 146 yards last week against, against Wisconsin, but I'm telling you, I've told this to Dr. Rob. I've watched a lot of college football over the last 30 years of my life. I've seen some pretty darn good football teams. Their defense is one of the best defenses I've ever seen in college football. There it is. I get it. Well, coach, they're skilled the whole thing. These two defenses are a lot alike in their metrics and their statistics. Um, when you talk about Minnesota's too. Oh, by the way, I wanted to say this real fast before we jump into it here, Travis. Come on, man. Get that bankroll out. Get those big bucks that you're hiding away. Dust them off a little bit. Creak open that wallet and plunk some money down on the under. Not that I think that's the right play, but because you're about a point over the lowest college football total we've seen of all time. Really? Which was set by Iowa and Northwestern a few weeks ago. <laughs> so if we can get this number to drop from 32 and a half down to 31, we're, we're talking about we sat here on a show and we were involved in history. So creak open that wallet, 
you know, break open the big bucks and put a few bucks on the under of this game so we can okay. lower that total a little bit. All right. <laughs> Having settled I'll do, that. I'll right? do it. I'll, I'll, I'll drive to the Spearmint Rhino tomorrow. <laughs> I'll park on the Iowa side of the parking lot. I'll pull out my Betfred Sports app and I and I'll bet the I'll put twenty five bucks on the under. There you go. That, there you that'll go. lower it. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Sure it will. Sure it will. All across the country, <laughs> Costa Rica. <laughs> I'm centered. I'm looking at this total. The first thought is when I see a total like this is who in the heck wants to watch a game with a total of thirty two and a half? <laughs> and then I think you know well those who like defense you know the Ibas you know Hank Iba Mo Iba they probably like a game like this. <laughs> uh, but listen, here's the thing. Here's a little bit. I'm not the first one to say this, but it's out there. Um, football totals of 33 or less, and this includes FCS, are 10 and 1 to the over. So that's just a thought to put out there is that, you know, you can get a pick six, you get a bad offense that goes up against a really good defense, which is the case in both of these. And uh, God bless you, Rob. And, uh, and, and you can see maybe all of a sudden this game, which was, you know, 17 to 10 with four minutes to go, ends up 24 to 10 or goes to overtime tied at 17. You got the over. So uh, the under won't be a play for me for those reasons. The problem with Iowa is those metrics on offense. Uh, they're in the 80s and yards per game margin. They're in the 60s and yards per point margin. And I know they put three wins together now against weakish Big Ten opposition. But Minnesota is the better team when you talk about offense and defense combined in this game. That doesn't mean they win uh, just because they have a better team. But I think they're going to win 21-16. I think it's going to be in that neighborhood talking about the Gophers. I do believe they'll be able to run enough. Uh, I don't know that there's going to be, you know, five touchdowns in that 21-16. Uh, but I think seven field goals to maybe four for Iowa, Iowa and a couple of safeties, and we got 21-16. But, uh, yeah, I, I do think Minnesota finds a way to win this by four or five points. Man, you're breaking my heart, man. You're breaking every <laughs> Iowa fan's heart. Sorry about that. <laughs> they, they, they are convinced they're going to be in Indianapolis for the Big Ten title game. Just because it, it's like they, they've won, what, uh, three in a row now? Is right. it four in a row? Three in a row. Uh, yeah. Three in a row. They, they, they know that Illinois plays, you know, Michigan this weekend. It's, it's like a rite of passage. It's like they belong in Indianapolis. Do you but, want to play the Buckeyes, you know, again this year? I mean, I know the defense wasn't that bad. They only gave up, like, what, 370 yards or something like that against Ohio State. Yeah. But Ohio State's seen you now. And remember last year, you know, what happened against Michigan. And I'm thinking, do you really want to face one of those two teams with no offense? Well, it's interesting that you think Ohio State, because I still think Michigan's going to beat Ohio State, but that's probably good. That's going to be a conversation we have next week for the game. Um, Do you have money on the the Iowa-Minnesota game? You're just going to lay off of it. Lay off of it. Lean towards Minnesota. Um, Of the games we're talking about, the one game that I have my money on right now is Liberty. And uh, I'll probably have five plays as all this week, the way I'm looking at the card. You know, the interesting part is, uh, Scott, we did did our podcast on Sunday, and and our whole podcast was, let's not get caught in the rumors. Trev Alberts has run this coaching search, uh, you know, perfectly. And then Rob puts a a poll out on on his Twitter page, and it starts the rumor mill again. (laughs) Well, I got to be honest. I wasn't even trying to start a rumor mill. I was just kind of curious. Hey, here's – and I told people, here's some of the names that are getting tossed around – who do you like as a, from a, from a fan standpoint, who do you like? That was the question. And, and he put out Matt rule, Luke fickle, Doran down at North Carolina state. And who was the other one? It was uh, oh Lance Leipold at KU. Yeah. And it's funny though, Rob, I was sitting at dinner tonight and the rumor mill starting up. Everybody's like, I hear it's rule. I hear it's rule. I hear it's Matt rule. That and yeah, but I mean that's ob- that's kind of the obvious pick. Well, here's the interesting part. Well, it's- obvious if you're going to say you're going to announce it before the end of the season. Yes. Now Nebraska has canceled all recruiting visits for this weekend. It's senior week. It's it's the senior game. All recruiting visits have been called off. Well, hold on a second. I mean, I. So I dug into this a little bit, and I could okay. be wrong, and maybe you've got more updated info. No, I don't. I, I don't. The last info I got on this was they canceled official visits for the weekend. Okay. But they only had one official visit scheduled anyway. Okay. And the kid who was coming, it was a JUCO D lineman, he had stated previously in the past he only wanted to come on his official visit to Nebraska if Nebraska had had already uh, 
a decision made on a head uh, coach. Okay, that makes sense then. That makes or had, sense. Had, an, had announced their decision on the head coach. My understanding is they're still hosting all their normal okay. official game day visits where you got your 20 guys on the sidelines. Now, you can still come as an official visitor to a game day visit. It's just, I mean, you've got some stuff in terms of who's paying for the trip, things like that, that'll make it one of your five official visits or however many they get these days. But so that that's what I heard. And so I think it was a lot of, it kind of stirred the pot a little bit there, but my understanding it was you had one guy with an official visit. He canceled because he wants to wait until Nebraska makes a decision on the head coach and announces it. So he's rescheduling. And so they said, okay, you know what? He was the only one we had anyway we're not going to do any official visits this week and we'll still host the game day recruits though. I was going to ask Rob real quick, if you're a sophomore right now at Nebraska and you're playing at the level that you did in your college career. So you're up front on offense of the legit possibilities. I'm not talking about the Deion Sanders the level I played at. Right. So, I mean, you played at a high level, you got drafted by the giants. You know what I mean? So you, what I'm saying is you're playing now you're, you're a sophomore, you're 19, 20 years old. You've got a couple of years left of college. What coach is a legitimate contender for the job? You know, tossing out Dion, tossing out Urban Meyer, things like that. Guys who have a legitimate shot. Who's the one that would spark your interest or the locker room as a player? Is it is it Matt Rule? Well, that's a you know what? It, that's a hard one. That's a hard question to answer. I mean, a lot of it is in, in my entire football career, high school, college, NFL. I only had one coaching change within a team and that was with the Giants they fired Dan Rees we went to Jim Fossil you know that was what it, it's it's hard to it's hard to say because truthfully I mean I don't know how many high school and college kids really paid attention to how Matt Rule did at Temple and Baylor because I mean within their mind that was back when they were sophomores in high school, juniors in high school. I don't know if they were really paying attention to it that much. So it's, I I think it's hard for those guys to look at a situation like that. I mean, you know who Matt rule is. I'm sure you know who most of these other coaches are. Um, I mean, I think you want somebody who's got, got a good track record shows that they can win games and seems a little bit like they're going to be somewhat of a player's coach, at least in terms of running the program. I I don't know who the players would want. I mean, if I was a player in that situation, obviously I'd want the guy that I think could win right now at Nebraska. And I don't know if I've got it, even as a player at Nebraska right now, I don't know if I've got a good answer for that. Yeah. I think yeah. I'd probably look at a guy like Leipold where you saw that really, really Kleinman. quick turn. Why, why, why don't they go after Kleinman? I, I'm not following enough as far as who's going to be the next coach. You know, I mean, I know he was coaching north of Nebraska a while back, and now what he's done with Kansas State, you know. I, yeah. I just his, – his name just never comes up, at least out here. You, you, I, you know, we – it got – boring. It, it's boring. Is that really, is it that bad? No, I, I mean, it, it gets tossed around a lot. I think if there was anything against Kleiman, um, it wasn't this immediate turnaround at Kansas State. I mean, he got down there and everybody's like, man, this guy, he, he followed Bull up at NDSU and churned out a whole bunch of national titles. Yeah. And he got down here to K State and he did kind of so-so for a year or two then he did okay for a year or two then a little better for a year and now this year all of a sudden they're playing pretty solid football um but it wasn't one of these sudden turnarounds and all of a sudden it's this hey they're going to be competing for the big 12 title within a year of him hitting the door down there that didn't happen it's been kind of this slow rise and so i think it's just People talk about him. People mention him. I like Kleiman a lot. I think he's a program builder. I think he's a very good coach. I know a few of the guys on his staff. Connor Riley is the O line coach there. He's a UNO grad. Yep. Um, but you've got some good people on that staff. It just kind of happened slow enough that I don't think it really got anybody really excited about him. I, I think people want to really see 
that quick turnaround. You see, and that's part of the reason why I think rule sort of appeals to a lot of fans, maybe not everybody, but to a lot of fans. Cause you, you look at temple, he had one or two bad years at the start. And then it was five or six win season, then a couple of nine win seasons. And, had them playing well. You look at them down at Baylor, and it was a one and eleven season. Uh, his second year is either six and seven or seven and six. I can't remember. And then he goes eleven and three and goes to the Sugar Bowl. And the losses he had two losses to Oklahoma. One was a one score loss during the regular season. The other was an overtime loss uh, in the Big Twelve title game and then had a one-score loss to Georgia in the Sugar Bowl. Those were his three losses that last year. You saw literally this very sharp progression, and it happened fast over three seasons. People get excited about that. You look he's at a young Leib- guy, too. He's a young guy, too. Is the, yeah. He's like 47-48, which I like. And that's, you know. Well, and that's the other thing that I think ap- appeals to, to people, that they look at that and they think, okay, well, if this guy does well and he decides to stay – his career theoretically he's going for another 20 years exactly yep well Well, let's dive into uh the game on saturday it's senior day in in lincoln uh wisconsin at nebraska wisconsin a 13 point favorite uh the money my money line's all over the place but i can tell you the money line's at wisconsin at minus 495 there's nebraska i have it on there twice at plus 365 that over and under at three 39 and a half scott yeah, you know, it's I haven't seen this in a long time, but there are books right now where you can lay 10 and a half with Wisconsin and other books, as you show there. You can lay as much as 13. You don't see books two and a half points off a of spread hardly yeah. ever. I can't remember the last time I saw that. So, And, and to be fair, I, I didn't use your – I pulled this one from Bet Fred this afternoon, so I pulled this it's one out from there. Bet. Yeah. yeah, there's a there's couple. I mean, it's mostly 12 and a half, 11 and a half, 11, couple of 10 and a halfs. But I've never seen this much disparity between – you know, books in a long time, a couple of points off. And um, I, I, here's the thing, man. I, I know that you look at Wisconsin and you're thinking, do I want to lay those, all those points and basically have to win by 14 or more, by two touchdowns or more with that spread, whether it be 10 and a half or 13. Uh, but I'm looking at that injury list and it, it reads like a Leo Tolstoy novel. I mean, it is huge. <laughs> you know, it'd take you like three days to read their injury list. So I'd be a little bit concerned there. They've got three tight ends who are questionable. They got uh, two or three linebackers who are questionable. A couple of the D linemen who are listed as questionable right now. So it's not like the Badgers are coming in uh, with a lot of good health on their side. And then, of course, with Nebraska, I, I don't know how you could bet this game without knowing for sure if Casey Thompson's going to play. You know, I saw where he's still being listed as questionable. At least that's the official injury list in the college football world of betting with the sports books. If he can play, I don't have any problem with somebody taking the points with Nebraska. It might be one of those things where, hey, I'm going to grab 13 or 12 and a half now. And if Casey Thompson doesn't play, as soon as I find out, I'm going to lay some points with Wisconsin, you know, to at least get my money back, so to speak, because there's no way I'm betting on what Nebraska has after Casey Thompson. No way. And of course, Chubba Purdy is out. Um, He's got the ankle issue. It's just a mess. It is just a mess. I mean, when, when have they last had a quarterback who could lead you to a potential of a conference championship game. I'm trying to think of 2008, 2009, spacing off his name right now. You guys can know, was it Daly or? Uh, no, well, Joe, no, Joe Daly would have been the, uh, he would have been the quarterback with Bill Callahan that first Okay. Year. Yeah. So that would have been early on. So, yeah, so I'm talking 2000... like Eric, Eric Crouch, Daly. I mean, seriously, Taylor Martinez was fun to watch. It was going to lead you to a championship. You know, I mean, I mean he was good, you know, but. That next level quarterback that could put a team on his shoulders and take you with that confidence level of your offense that you need to get to a championship game. I, I just haven't seen it in Lincoln for a while, guys. And if, if Casey Thompson's not playing, here's their power ratings. I'm going to read this off to you. I didn't want to forget this. They are power rated Nebraska lower than Florida Atlantic, Louisiana Lafayette, Army. Oh, yeah, Vanderbilt. <laughs> I mean, their power rating. Listen, I'm a UNLV guy. I've been out here since I got out of high school. Their power rating is three and a half points better than UNLV right now on a neutral field. That's how far the Nebraska program has dropped. It's dropped 20, excuse me, 30 spots since Mickey Joseph took over. They were 57th after the loss to Georgia Southern. They're 87th now by most people's power ratings. So I'm not saying that's all on MJ because it all adds up over the course of the season. 
but that shows you that the trend is going downward rather than upwards. If he was having a great impact on this team and they didn't have the injuries, they'd probably be in that 60 to 70 range at worst. But they're 87th in college football behind Louisiana Lafayette, Vandy, Army. It's pretty crazy. Wow. Well, you just you just depressed it, everybody. I hate right? it. I hate it myself. You know, I'm not sitting here going, "No, this is great." You know, I got you know Nebraska memorabilia in my office. You know, it kind of stink right now. <laughs> uh, good stuff. Hey, everybody, make sure to check out the Doc's diagnosis. You can find it on the YouTube channel. Just follow it at Doc Talk Sports. It's uh, presented by Centris Federal Credit Union. Uh, lots of good stuff on there. Doctor Rob draws up lots of good plays. Uh, so go check out the Doc's Diagnosis. If you like what you hear from Scott Spritzer, check him out at Scott Wins on Twitter. You can also find his stuff at DocSports.com. Right now, you can uh, work with Scott each and every day. Just text the word Doc Talk to the number 29022, and they will text you a link where you can have access to all of Scott's important pages and his free pick videos, as well as a page where you can sign up and get $60 at Scott's premium member only picks. Again, that's the word Doc Talk to the number 29022 for more free picks from Scott Spritzer seven days a week. Do you want a free bet from Betfred Sports? Well, we're here to give you one. Download the Betfred Sports app on the Apple and Google Play stores. Uh, create a new account. Use the promo code Doc Talk, and you get 20 bucks. That's good in Arizona, Colorado, and Iowa. Don't forget, tonight's show is for entertainment purposes only. If you have a gambling problem, call 1-800-GAMBLER. That's 1-800-GAMBLER. Follow Doc uh, Talk Sports on uh, on uh, YouTube. Subscribe to our YouTube channel. Like our Facebook page. Follow Dr. Rob on Twitter. And uh, you can follow me on Twitter at Travis Creates. Any parting words of wisdom from you two? Go Giants. Look at that. <laughs> Go Giants. Go, Go Giants. Go Liberty. Go Flames. <laughs> there we go. That's it. If you want to know who Scott's got his money on. One of the games this week. It, yeah. it's, it's the Liberty Flames. For Dr. Rob Zadiska, for Scott Spreicher, I'm Travis Justice. We will talk to you next week on Behind the Point Spread. See you later. Texas hanging one on Gonzaga right now by about 20. Are they? Yeah, they're up.